to 5th Annual Library Con. Today we're here with Pathway Comics. We have Brian and Sela Douglas with us. Pathway Comics is the self-publishing company of married couple Brian and Sela Douglas, creators of the all-girl kid superhero team, The Dimensionals. Brian is a former underground cartoonist who has co-illustrated a New York Times bestseller called The Alphabet of Manliness. And Sela is a former arts educator at the Doherty Arts School in Austin. They're in their comic book endeavors by their two young children. You can find them online at pathway-comics.com. Welcome, Brian and Sila. Thank you. All right, thank Hi, thank you. Um, so to start off with, can you tell us a bit about your book, uh, The Dimensionals, and how that idea came to you? Yeah, well, I've always wanted to do a kid superhero team um, in the style of kind of class back 1980s 1970s marvel and dc comics where they were you know trying to do a story that any age kid could pick it up and start reading it but um we're trying to have a story that would still entertain adults even because they're trying to entertain themselves as well as their audience uh so uh i'd never seen a all-girl uh team in that style of comic before um, so we ended up wanting to, um, have just this all girl kid team, um, for a while for, yeah, it was actually Sila's idea to work on superhero comics at all. I was trying to do all kinds of comics that, you know, uh, like I say, underground style comics that, uh, really didn't have a lot of audience potential. Um, but Sila would point out to me that you love these, you love superheroes, why not do it how you want to do it and do your own superhero thing? So, like, make comic books like the ones that made him love comic books. Basically, I'm like, why aren't you doing what actually is your favorite thing about comics? <laughs> so, he was yeah. like, why am I not doing why, that? Yeah, why am I not? <laughs> oh. uh, so, you can can you tell us a bit about the team, the makeup of the team, what their powers are? Yeah, so uh, the oldest character is Queen Kinesis, who is kinetic. She can move things with her mind. Uh, but the wrinkle on it is that uh, her power increases over a distance and decreases the closer she is to the object she wants to move. So from far away, she can topple a mountain. But up close, she can like take supreme effort just to rattle a teacup, you know? Uh, so she has to keep her enemies at bay or else she's in hot water. Uh, Replica is our teleporter. Uh, every time she teleports, she's the mirror image of herself. And when she's that mirror image version, uh, gravity doesn't know what to do with her. It's very confused by her. It wants to just neither pull her down or push her away. Instead, it just sort of shunts her off to the side to try and get rid of her. Uh, so she kind of like flies by falling sideways. And she also has a gravity drop. And she has a gravity drop as well. Uh, yeah, over time, like we develop new powers for them as the stories kind of call for it. Uh, so yes, when she's her flipped over self, uh, when she lets go of something, it no longer falls, it falls up. Uh, Megalith is our size changer, so she's a giant, or she can shrink down to, uh, to tiny sizes, and she can bring things with her either way, uh, like, you know, create, make a snail enlarge to a uh, dire wolf size. Uh, but she can only do it for as long as she can hold her breath. Um, the oxygen molecules in the air don't know what to do with her lungs when she's the wrong size we tried to think a little bit more about science when we made uh the powers and their limitations than a lot of comics tend to do the bosonic girl uh we were using the concept of bosons both like all particles in the universe are supposed to be either fermions or bosons and the fermions are like the solid particles uh that matter is made of but bosons are like energy particles so the main thing that's supposed to separate these two things these two concepts is supposed to be that uh Fermions can't occupy the same space, but bosons can. So bosons are like flashlight beams. Like flashlight beams, right? You can put many. tons and tons of flashlight beams in the same space, and it's never going to spill over. So she can phase using that power into other solid objects, um, but the object has to be as wide as she is at her widest point, like her shoulders. So you know she can she could like phase into a tablecloth even, but uh, if somebody, if somebody came along and folded cloth, it too small, she'd be trapped inside. She gets stuck. <laughs> um, have you added characters as you've gone along or, or has it been basically the same group of uh, superheroes same core group of our superheroes but there have been lots and lots of characters that they've met and come up against 
foes, possible, you know, allies that aren't what they seem. All kinds of uh, big characters get introduced in each issue. And um, we usually try to, like with the, you know, character pages in the back, uh, let people know who the new people are and kind of more about their backstory than the story alludes to. Yeah. Is there a main villain or do you introduce new villains as well? We've been introducing new villains. We try to, you know, I always feel like it's a ripoff. If you buy a, a superhero comic and there's not a cool villain in it, right? I'm like, come on, you got to have a villain. So each issue does have a new villain. Sometimes they turn out to be friends later on, but for that one issue, there'll be some kind of conflict. Um, uh, we're building up to a, like we've had allusions to a like arch enemy, um, but we haven't yet revealed that one. So we're trying to like slowly develop uh, that concept. Don't want to rush it. Okay. Hey, so um, you both work as a team to complete this book. Uh, can you describe the way you collaborate on this project? Yeah. So I, uh, I'm the writer and the artist, uh, the original artist, like the, um, I do the black and white artwork. Um, I give my ideas to Seal. I talk about like what ideas I've got pretty much at every stage. Uh, and she'll kind of give me like an editor's view of like, the idea is great or that one's not so good. Uh, yeah, he does the writing and drawing. I do the coloring and sort of the second set of eyes, second brain on is this working? Does this, you know, communicate effectively? Um, does this make sense? Is this funny? Um, things yeah. like that. And I'm very comfortable telling him, and he's comfortable with me because we have that relationship and it's really important to have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of that's gonna be truthful with you um, and that you're not gonna get upset over. So it took a little bit of balancing to figure out that dynamic, but yeah. I basically, things have to go through me um, to be able to make it to print and I'm very comfortable drawing a line and uh, I do all the coloring and sometimes have to fix um, art mistakes. Yeah, I'm, I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm fast, but I'm not super consistent. So sometimes I'll draw a face that doesn't really look like all the other faces that we had for that character. And see was great at catching that and, you know, oh, come on now, let's, oh. He has a tendency to draw hands too big, so I go in and make hands smaller. Shrink. Like that. Um, um, I, we call it creative editor, kind of, is the title we decided. <laughs> Um, so what are some of your must-have tools uh, for creating, either techie tools or favorite art tools? Well, uh, my favorite art tools are, you know, old classic, um, you know, uh, ink pens and quill, you know. Uh, um, like dip ink pens. Dipping the ink oh. and all that stuff. But the only problem with that is that it takes so much time uh i mean it's it's worth it if you have time to do it but we it, these comics are so time consuming we don't really have time uh to do it that way so yeah we both prefer to work analog <laughs> i guess but end up working digitally just out of interest of time and practicality um i love doing watercolor and colored pencils um, and uh, various mediums, but um, I end up using an iPad with Procreate um, has been my favorite program. I used to do Photoshop, but um, it was slower than I wanted it to be. And um, when I moved to an iPad, um, that was what I wanted, the more um, interactive um, and like you could use a pencil with it and stuff like that. So um, I've been really happy with Procreate. Um, and he uses a Wacom tablet uh, to do the ink ink version. And then he sends it to me and I color it and get it all souped up and ready for print. Uh, so what is, uh, if you were looking at your timeline, how long does it take to do an issue from start to finish? Well, the fastest we've ever been able to do was uh, three months from start oh, to finish. Wow. Um, yes, but unfortunately, we've not been able to maintain that. And it's not sadly. because of the, it's not, sadly, not because of just the art. It's because of everything else that keeps yeah. us from getting to the art. But sometimes we also uh, get into kind of roadblocks with the story or um, 
with something changing, like he'll make up a part of the story and I'll be like, no, this isn't working. And he'll have to go back and redo yeah. a lot. So you have two children. Um, do they have any input on the comic? Yeah, actually they do. Um, we bring them along uh, to uh, when we do comic cons and they um, love to do art and tell stories also and love comic books. Um, so they're very in the world um, of comics fandom, uh, but they're both full of ideas. Our daughter, a lot of times we um, uh, use as a figure model actually, because our characters are kids. And so she'll do wacky poses for us. Um, so Brian can get uh, a good <laughs> accurate drawing. And um, our son actually, they both are credited in different issues with different things. Our son, yes. uh, our son created uh, um, some cartoony superheroes that uh, fit in, like animal superheroes that fit in with like this sort of, you know, augmented reality <laughs> danger room that our kids have. So Uncle Ham here is a patriotic <laughs> pig. Uh, that's all. That's all our son, and, and, he, and we credited yeah. him in the back. <laughs> Because it was his idea. And uh, our daughter wrote a short story about one of our characters. Yeah, I think in this issue here. Um, like a... Like a little, short little solve-it-yourself mystery. She really wants to be a mystery. Oh, awesome. So we yeah. let her write like a little one-page story about... Oh, great. ...with one of our characters. Um, but yes, they both are full of ideas and wish they could have much more of a power role in the creation. <laughs> Um, but we let them do what we feel like is, is excusable. Yeah. <laughs> do they create their own comics? They do. They do. Um, yeah. Our daughter's a little bit more into the kind of amount of time it takes to really get down a story. And she's starting to really understand um, how to construct uh, a story um, in a cohesive and understandable linear way. Um, with drawings that like tell the story as much as the words do. And um, our son is constantly coming up with characters and he's, he's really into cosplay is more his bag um, than writing. Um, but he loves um, art and all kinds of characters and is just a big fan of all of it. Yeah. We love comics for all ages. It's a great way to get them reading and writing and creating and coming up with artwork. Um, so I'm always excited when my daughter has those kinds of assignments because <laughs> they're fun. We really feel like comics are kind of underrated when it comes to uh, encouraging kids to read um, because they're just so engaging and the pictures really draw a kid in, in a way that a whole page of text just won't do and um, also help with like associating you know and understanding words because you can look at the pictures and get you know clues from what the pictures tell you about what's happening and um, I learned words reading comics I read uh, ElfQuest at a very young age and it has big words and big ideas in it and um, they're educational and people don't realize it all the time do you remember the first comics you ever read? Mine were probably ElfQuest, except, no, the first ones, my mom had some old reissued Batman, like, for, like, the first couple of issues of Batman, like, these big ones. Mm -hmm. And so I would go through those as very young child. But the first ones that my sister and I actually got into were probably ElfQuest, because I think we were in kindergarten when we picked that one up. Um, so... My first one would be uh, probably would be uh, those little little paperbacks of uh, Peanuts comic strips. It would reprint like a bunch of the old strips. Uh, yeah, just discovering those and uh, just being fascinated at like how few words uh, you know one of those strips might have and how simple the drawings were, but like how how much story and the character and the emotion that you know they could squeeze out, they could convey with just a couple of squiggly lines and, you know, and a couple of boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, were you drawing back then? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, when you can go back, you, uh, you know, my parents would just always let me have all the paper I wanted to draw on. Um, and so you can kind of see how, yeah, my drawings look like pretty much any kid's drawings uh, at the beginning. And then over time, you can just kind of watch them get like better and better just from me doing it all the time. Um, yeah. A lot of people, my mother was an art teacher for almost 40 years. Um, and uh, a lot of people feel like art is like bestowed upon you by some fairy godmother and you either get it or you don't. And it's like any other skill. And if you practice, you get better. It's just like basketball or, you know, learning your times tables. Like it works just the same. So if you practice a lot, you will get better. So what were some of your favorite things to draw back then? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, I would sort of just get inspired by whatever I was watching. I, you know, like um, uh, the Smurfs were a cartoon that was on TV. And I was like just fascinated by, like, okay, yes, there's a whole little world here. There's about a hundred little characters and <laughs> they have this and that. And so I would like, okay, I'll... I can make, uh, and like the gremlins was big too. So I was like, okay, I can make like little, a bunch of little gremlin type characters, but like gremlins with the Smurfs and, you know, the big, I'll make about a hundred of them and they'll live, you know, near dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just make up, I mean, really my, um, I've always just been like a storyteller. Like I like to, I would, you know, sit on the playground with other kids and just tell stories, try and keep their attention on the playground equipment. Um, and uh, the drawings were just like a part of that, like a way to like work on a story, even when no one was around to watch, just to amuse myself and, and practice at it and maybe make up plans for future storytelling sessions. But uh, um, so, yeah, like, oh God, I mean, like pretty much anything that I liked, I would like do my own version of it, you know. I'm not a cartoonist. I'm more of a fine artist. Um... I obviously drew little characters and stuff uh, growing up, but uh, and had little uh, characters that I would come up with. I had one that was inspired by a drawing that I did. I had this really fat cat, and I figured out how to draw him in this specific way that he would lay down all the time <laughs> that I thought was really cute. And I tried to do like a little character of that for a while, and. I had a couple of stylized things inspired by drawings that I like had done my own style, but I never really got into the storytelling aspect of it. Um, I got a lot more interested pretty quickly in just the art um, and creating images. Um, and again, I got really inspired by ElfQuest. I also read a lot of uh, like Teen Titans and Excalibur and loved the artwork in those and some, uh, early like she hulks and wonder woman's um but uh um i traced a lot from art that i loved and feel like that helped me because i was like if i can trace it and know what it feels like to make those motions that's gotta help right um but i also just love them so much that i just wanted to do it and i think feel like tracing is is kind of an underrated uh skill um and i got really good at tracing and that led to me getting better at, I'm pretty good at uh, reproducing like a, a picture. Like if I can look at a picture, I can draw a pretty good replica of it. So, but I had an art teacher for a mom, so I practiced all kinds of different art. I, we did uh, multimedia growing up. <laughs> um, can you talk a bit about the process for creating the look of your characters? Yeah. Um, well, you know, with these characters, we, we wanted to try and um, create a look that would let people know what they were getting. Uh, we didn't want to make anything, you know, too radically different. Uh, we wanted to give them sort of classic superhero feels. Um, we... Um, uh, there's a whole lot of color theory that went into it that uh hey we talked i was a lot of figuring out the clothes because um i actually have a degree in costume design and um so if he has an idea for a costume he'll bring it to me and i a lot of times will have a lot to say because 
first and foremost, one of the main rules of costume design is that you don't make a costume look costumey. Um, it has to be functional. And when, I, when I heard that, <laughs> I was like, okay, you're crazy. <laughs> The costume. It has um, to be costumey. That means you did it right. <laughs> so I was very concerned about the functionality. Um, we also were um, informed by the fact that we have young characters. Like we didn't want to age them up in the way that they were dressed, and we didn't want to make it about their bodies. We wanted to make it about their practical purposes and, and the functionality of what they were trying to do and get accomplished and, and what their strengths were. And um, I decided on the color balance, mostly, you know, you think about um, what you haven't seen before because you don't want to have a derivative looking character. Um, but you also think about what colors look good as a team. We debated making their costumes all match, um, but we decided to make their costumes all very um, different, but still kind of balanced with each other. Like they're all a little bit different. None of them are like kind of repetitive of each other. Um, and, but it's not like we have a real clear set either. I mean, we have a red character, but it's not like we have the other primaries or like, you know, red and green right. or, you know, any colors that kind of go together in a way we kind of made it a, a mishmash that was harmonious. <laughs> yeah. And it took, there was a lot of going back and forth with all this. Like, you know, I would be like, Oh, this character wears a cape. And Sila would be like, why? And I would be like, I, I quit. I don't know. I can't answer that. I, but we, <laughs> so she would explain, no, these things should have a function. There should be a purpose. It's part of the story. And then that cheered me up again. And so we would, you know, move forward. But yeah, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, give and take, and and uh, um, moving these ideas, moving these yeah. chess pieces around until. And like we have one character who's in, uh, she's actually wearing a fencing outfit, um, and Brian actually studied fencing in college, and so he knew some about it. But part of that was because she's our character that flips, and a fencing outfit is asymmetrical. And so you can tell when she's flipped because of her costume, as opposed to any any other character. You couldn't tell because their 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 costumes are symmetrical. And she's also the character that falls sideways. So there was a practical aspect of she would want more protection on one side, which is what that fencing costume does. Uh, the side that you are pointing at your opponent as they're trying to poke you with the foil uh, is way more protected. And the character that we have in the big uh, cloak is the character that stronger the farther away she is. And so the idea is that her cloak is supposed to make her look bigger and more like, it's almost like a animal like defense of like, stay away, I'm dangerous kind of signal to her enemies. Cause she's actually just like a 12 year old girl. So she has to do something to look like more intimidating <laughs> than she naturally is physically. Um, so how many issues do you have so far? Uh, we just uh, finished our sixth issue, uh, about halfway done with our seventh issue. Uh, and uh, the first few issues we've got collected is a graphic novel. So that's a oh, little, awesome. It's like a, a little bit it's thicker. It's our first back. three. It's our kind of origin story. Yep. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, so let's see. So any artists sometimes have to keep future projects secret. Is there anything you can tell us about uh, upcoming projects, either with dimensionals or are you branching out to other things? Uh, we still have each dimensional story has given us a bunch more ideas for other dimensional stories. So we have a lot more that we want to do on these guys. Uh, the next issue, the seventh issue is going to be uh, a time travel story with a lot of Texas history uh, mixed yeah. in. Uh, well, so, Brian gets inspired a lot by things that are local. Like we used the um, the city library um, <laughs> until the little bird thing that's in the city library. That's like the setting of one of our, com well, a kind of magical version of the library is the setting of our comics. So that's like a local thing. 
and we like to tie a, tie in things. He wanted a library that looked like a maze, kind of, and he was uh, uh, in, inspired by the library and the way that it's constructed is very M.C. Escher with the staircases. Um, but uh, uh, he gets really inspired by history and science, and we look to um, a lot of, you know, uh, past uh, inspiration. Um, like we had an, an issue where we used uh, some characters from the movie Hidden Figures, like the women that worked at NASA to kind of inspire a whole set of characters that they meet up with from another dimension. Um, and we use kind of their jobs to inspire their powers that we gave them. And so he finds inspiration everywhere. Um, we're going to be incorporating or doing a nod to the Elizabeth Nay Museum in an upcoming uh, issue because he's all over Texas history and how Elizabeth Nay ties in and it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> and so he's got a very... Uh, active imagination and is always thinking ahead so um we like to tie in local stuff and um we'll have more of that for sure and then after that we're gonna have four issues that'll each one focus on one of the characters one of the dimensionals and like really try and flesh out you know their backstories like spotlight issues yeah like have more of their families more of you know um how they interact with other super beings in their world um, which is going to be sort of like a way to talk about, you know, um, how kids these days have to interact with grown-ups that, you know, they sometimes will like and agree with and sometimes not agree with. And, you know, uh, how complicated that can be just for everybody these days. So, yeah. But yeah, we, we right off the bat had our characters going on major adventures. So... Now that we've got a few issues, we wanted to take some time for the audience uh, to kind of give us a little bit more depth. Um, so how can we keep up with the dimensionals and your work? We have a website, which you uh, listed earlier. Um, we do sell some of our issues just locally in a few stores. Um, but you can always email us with questions. We have like a letters page that we love to encourage kids to write in questions or comments or any kind of fan art or anything. We'd be more than happy um, to uh, print up their questions in our issues and answer them so that if other people have those same questions, they can have them answered. And we're moving more and more towards that as we are able to get some feedback from fans. Um, but that's something that we are really excited about. So you're going to be, Brian, you'll be giving our guests a drawing lessons right after this. Um, so what will they need to have handy and what will you be going over? Uh, I want to talk to them about the importance of um, sketching their drawings, like the whole concept and people use those words the same sketching, drawing, it's the same, right? But um, sketching for us is really trying to like draw out the shapes that are inside your final drawing. Like instead of just trying to draw like an arm and a hand, how it looks like, like the outlines. Outline. Instead, trying to like draw like the little cylinders and the little you know curvy shapes or inside, like the, the like square the, of your hand and yeah. you know the triangle that gets made with your fingers and things like, like that. For example, just I'll do it right here. Uh, <laughs> when I when I uh, draw a hand, I always start with a shape uh, of the inside of the hand, like that. Uh, like I'll draw that on like a stick, like the stick will be the arm. Oh, can we get the stick better? Mm. Uh, no. uh, so he's going to be talking I'll about be showing sketching, how I do that. Right. But um, it would be good if they had maybe some lighter colored pencils and then something darker, like a regular pencil or a pen. Um, because he talks about um, his method of doing a very rough draft version and then going over with darker lines um, to finalize the the image. And he can do it digitally, but he used to do it on paper because there's a special kind of pencil that won't uh, photocopy, but they could practice with any light colored pencil. Awesome, all right. And lots of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you both for joining us. It was so great to talk to you. I wish we could hang out in person, hopefully next year. 
Oh, I know. We would love that. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. I'll see you guys next time. Okay, right. thank you. Hi, kids. Uh, my name is Brian, and I make comic books with my wife, Sela. And I'm here to uh, share some drawing tips with you guys today. So what we've done is we've made some videos of four different drawings. Uh, so you can watch, you know, how I make these pictures from uh, start to finish. So uh, let's start with this one. This is our character, the Bosonic Girl. Uh, you see she's in a very sketchy style here. That's what I want to show you guys, the importance of sketching your characters at the beginning of every drawing. Now, I start every drawing with a skeleton or stick figure that I can pose however I want. I figure out where the arms and legs are going to go, maybe change my mind. Uh, then we start fleshing out the figure, making the limbs and torso thicker and thicker as we go. Adding features like the eyes, uh, details like the hair, and uh, costume details too. Now this drawing was done on a computer, but this method of sketching works well with pencil. I'm going to fade the drawing out so um, uh, to give it more of a colored pencil look. Right now it looks more like markers. There we go. Um, now we're going to start going over it with a darker color. This is kind of a simulation of what's called inking, where someone will go over a sketchy pencil drawing and make final decisions in bold black ink. And that will give you the final result that you'll see in a finished comic book or graphic novel. You'll notice I didn't erase the mistake uh, when I decided to move her arm. You can still see that old arm. That's fine. That's part of sketching. You just move on to the lines that you want. Okay, next up uh, we have a cartoon dog. Once again, try to play with the shapes inside the character. You might want to look at a real dog or cat and really think about the shapes you're seeing under the fur and skin. Uh, the sketchy lines can be used to describe the fur and the skin, but they can also describe the bones and the muscles, too. So, uh, let's see here. Don't like that snout, so let me try something else. I'm exaggerating parts of this dog, like the eyes, for, you know, cartoonish effect. So I am erasing some things on this drawing. It's an example of case where leaving too many of these uh, marks that I decided against it was just going to get too confusing. So uh, they have got to go. There they go. All right, let's fix the legs up here and a nice little tongue going on there. Some spots. Yeah, okay. Now we're going to start inking it in here in darker color. Get the eyes. I'm going to confess, I am pretty sure this is not how dogs actually walk, uh, but <laughs> I like to try and put characters in dynamic poses, like poses as if they're moving. It's a storytelling idea. It helps the drawing not just be, oh, here's a dog just sitting there. It's a dog that's going somewhere. Where's the dog going? It's sort of a way to try and draw your audience in and have them care about uh, this drawing and care about the story you're trying to tell. All right, let's get some sh shading there. And... Yeah. Now we're gonna try a classic superhero. Again, starting with a skeleton stick figure good way to practice these stick figures is to do quick little, what they're called, gesture drawings, where you get a friend or a brother or sister to go through a bunch of poses for you, each one only for like 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, and you try to do a super fast drawing of them, just a stick figure drawing, before they move on to their next pose. So this is Black Panther. When you're drawing superheroes, you need to think about putting them in dynamic poses, like the feet spread real wide, or the arms stretch to extreme you know, positions. Even though your drawing is just going to be this motionless drawing on the page, it can feel like something has just happened or something is about to happen. 
while we flesh this one out and add details and a little cross hatching there on the face, uh, this is a good time I might mention that this drawing is sped up a little bit. I'm not quite this fast, so I don't want you to feel bad if it takes you longer to draw something similar. It took me a little longer too. There's times when I might, you know, stop to really think about where, what lines will go where. I might move my hand back and forth, kind of making a practice line to get a good feel for it before actually making the final uh, mark. Yeah, I get the hands here. I was also able, when you see me doing these hands, I'm zooming in really close to do more detail. I'm not drawing these hands as small as you're seeing. For me, it was uh, a much larger image. So as we wrap up T'Challa here, um, I just want to tell you guys to be sure to practice. Just practice a bunch. Uh, when I was a kid, I just loved to draw. I wasn't any better than really any other kids in my school, but I liked doing it so much, I just never stopped. And the more you do something, the better you get at it. And eventually, um, you find yourself improving. It's also reading a lot of comics and looking at a lot of comics and noticing, hey, I really like how that one person, you know, is drawing a face there, or how that hand is drawn there. So looking for tricks and um, just deciding, you know, what works, what doesn't work for you. Okay, just filling him in here with the inks leaving some spots uninked to be like little highlights and things and kind of making choices about what's going to be solid and what's going to be kind of sketched there we go okay next up we're going to do a character that looks like a piece of food like a cupcake but we're gonna, it's called anthropomorphizing something. We're gonna take something that's not human and make it kinda human. So you got a little grumpy face, grumpy eyebrow, sneer, all right. Arms in a angry little position. I was trying to think of something opposite to do to a sweet little cupcake. Um, so a grumpy persona, grumpy personality is what I decided was opposite. A delicious cupcake. Um, doing some shading here on the little cupcake uh, paper. And so when you're anthropomorphizing something, you can make all kinds of choices. Like I chose to put the face on the uh, top of the cupcake there, but it could have been that the face was down on the paper cup and all of the top was, you know, uh, its hair, maybe. Um, and I chose to give it really big feet with a wide stance, but that was another choice. It, you know, didn't have to have feet at all, or it could have had tiny little feet. Um, but I recommend trying to think of, in terms of opposites sometimes. It certainly works for me when making up a character like this, is to pick something opposite. Because when you're making these comic characters, you can combine opposite ideas into like a, just one character. And that can be a very powerful uh, way to talk about the ideas that you uh, want to talk about. So yeah, there's our uh, grumpy cupcake. Okay, that's our video, you guys. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you can find us at pathway-comics.com is our website. And uh, keep drawing, keep making those comics. We want to see them. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>